In the last segment, we distinguished security providers from security consumers and discussed their high-level security strategy. In this segment, we take a first step at implementing the security strategy. Therefore, we slip into the role of an organization that acts as a security consumer and wants to invest in real security for one of the reasons discussed in the last segment. Knowing that perfect security is impossible, the first question to ask is how much to spend on security. Security investment models help us to find an optimal level of security investment or at least approximate it in practice. We shall frame the security investment decision in the context of general investment theory. Using that language facilitates the communication with senior management to justify security spending or to compare it to competing investment options unrelated to security or even information technology. Investment theory is about comparing the cost of a potential investment to its benefit. For conventional investments, such as a new production plant or the development of a software package, costs and benefits arise at different points in time. As a result, much of the complexity of conventional investment theory is linked to making time cash flows comparable, including to account for ramifications of international taxation, etc. We will not go into this genre. For most security investment problems, time horizons are too short and parameter uncertainty is so high that we cannot justify the extra complication. For instance, the errors from omitting discounting are often negligible compared to other sources of error. So let us start with the simplest possible security investment model. It compares two quantities, both typically measured on monetary scales, cost and benefit of a security investment option. If the benefit is higher than the cost, a rational decision maker invests, otherwise he or she does not. One can find a bunch of formulas in the literature that quantify this ratio. Most authors call these indicators ROSI, shorthand for return on security investment and inspired by the ROI indicator in conventional investment theory. Keep in mind that ROSI values calculated with different definitions are not comparable on the same scale. By calculating the indicator is usually quite simple. It is much more complicated to precisely quantify its inputs. So let's devote more attention. What contributes to the cost of a security investment? Summing up the expenses for acquisition, development, and maintenance of security controls gives us a lower bound because this reflects only the direct cost. However, many security controls have significant indirect costs. For example, the monetary equivalent of time lost due to forgotten passwords after enforced changes, the inconvenience of transferring data between security zones, or incompatibilities between security mechanisms slowing down business processes. Also, if a security control enforces confidentiality of information that is relevant for a business decision, these decisions might be taken less informed and reach worse outcomes than with full information. This opportunity cost is part of the total cost of a security investment. This illustrates the difficulty of measuring the cost of an investment, although it is, in principle, a deterministic amount. The benefit of a security investment is not even deterministic. Benefits of security arise from prevented losses, but whether and how much an organization loses with and without security investment depends on exogenous factors, notably attacker behavior. A common simplification in the security investment literature is to model attacker behavior as random variable so that the benefit for a security investment emerges as the shift of probability mass between the loss distribution without security investment and the loss distribution with security investment. Distributions are hard to compare, so we project them to scalars, looking at moments, for example, the mean. This leads us to a definition of security benefits as the expected prevented loss. Dealing with complete loss distributions is still unwieldy, and does not add much if we have little information about the true shape of the loss distribution in practice. We conjecture that true loss distributions are zero inflated because there is some probability that no breach occurs. So it should look more like this. 
but we still don't know anything about the shape of the right tail. That is where the catastrophic risks are. To define this problem away, many security investment models simplify the benefit side to a simple Bernoulli random variable. They assume that a loss of fixed size lambda occurs with probability p. With probability 1 minus p, there is no loss at all. Security investment changes the probability of a loss via a breach probability function s, which, which takes as argument the cost of a potential security investment c. Now we have the main ingredients for a simple form of the popular security investment model proposed by Larry Gordon and Marty Loeb in 2002. The Gordon and Loeb framework allows us to plug in custom functional forms for the breach probability function s. This would be useful if one could easily determine the shape of s for a given organization. Unfortunately, I am not aware of a single serious attempt to do so in practice. So by instantiating s, we add another assumption to the model. In the absence of better information, it is reasonable to assume decreasing marginal benefits of security spending. Every additional dollar spent on security reduces the probability of a loss less than the last one. This leads to a shape as illustrated here. Decreasing marginal benefits can be justified by the observation that security managers would implement cheap controls first, leaving the more expensive ones for later. Or by the fact that with more controls installed, more coordination and interoperability issues arise. What do we gain from all these assumptions and formal machinery? Well, we can solve the model for the bottom line, that is, benefit minus cost, and find the value C star that maximizes the bottom line. This is the optimal level of information security investment from the organization's perspective. We can do this graphically, as shown here, numerically, or analytically by deriving the first order condition and solving for C star. More relevant for practitioners is another observation by Gordon and Loeb. They conjecture that for a large class of realistic breach probability functions, the optimal information security level is never higher than 37% of lambda, the fixed loss given breach. It's make, this makes a pretty useful rule of thumb to detect likely overspending. If you spend 5 million to protect an asset worth 10 million, then you are most likely burning money. Of course, this only gives a loose bound, and the rule doesn't tell us anything about if 1 million would be enough. Early proposals for security investment models answer the question, how much to invest? Their formal machinery is not very specific to the application in security. More recent models have become more domain-specific and refined towards answering questions on where to invest. These models consider, for instance, error rates of intrusion detection systems or the ability to learn from observing adversary behavior or penetration testing in order to reduce the defender's uncertainty. Security investment models are not always used standalone. They serve as building blocks for more complicated analytical models in security economics. For example, to model the security investment behavior of multiple firms with interconnected and hence interdependent assets, or to consider a combination of instruments for managing information security risk. We will follow up on this in the next segment.